Welcome, kings and queens, to another episode of Unapologetic, your number one podcast. This is the show where kings and queens tell their legacies and on. So get ready for the gems to drop and pull up to the table because we're ready. It's the whole trajectory of my life, in a sense. And I appreciate that, too. Yes, sir. But uh, to, to, for me, in, that, in this situation, man, you was so inspiring to a brother, you know what I'm saying? Cause, yeah. you know, when I did what I did, you know, in my past, we all messed up and I came home, I was lost. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have that circle of family and friends and, you know, stuff like that. Then that that word trust didn't yeah. exist yeah. In, that, in our mindset at that For particular real. time. Because yep. even though you have, you know, people that you you roll with behind bars, you don't really a hundred percent trust these these nah, people. Not 100, not you, barely, you barely at ten percent. I'm here yeah. because this yeah. is the only thing that I got to do. Yeah, but for sure. it to see you come out and out of that out of a cage physically and not still be caged mentally, I was yeah. blown. To, I was blown yeah. to hell, man, bro. I was for like. Real. Like what the what, what am I doing wrong, bro? What did I do wrong? <laughs> and that now you know it, it made me reflect a little bit, man. I can I did. I did come out focused. I immediately seen like the plagues that were existing inside the community, right? You know, you I, I immediately plagues? like the the horrible neglect that were occurring inside the city. Mm. I immediately noticed and identified. Um, the adversity that the culture and the community was facing. As soon as I touched down, I'm like, oh, this ain't how a city or a neighborhood is supposed to operate. These ain't how people are supposed to interact with one another. This is, right. you know, I thought I was a savage in prison. As soon as I come out, I, I hear about guys getting shot in broad daylight, kids killing kids. I'm like, this is beyond the level of savagery that I was up on, you know, when I was up in there. And I did a lot of crazy dumb stuff, but at this level out here, it just kind of it, so it, it, something clicked in me. So you saying that when you, for you, when you inside the cage, even though you saw violence, it was not at the level in society yeah, that you. It wasn't as severe. Like wow, we might fight. bro, that we says we a lot. Might fight. We might <laughs> fight. It might be a war. People might get whooped on. A couple people might get stabbed. But right. you got kids, right? 15, 16 years old walking around blowing other 15, 16 year old hairs, you know, hairs off. Like I never, I never imagined that mm. the level of savagery and would exist in a child to take it to that extreme and not care. Right. So they out here, they like, and they running around talking about I'm on demon time. I'm on demon time. Yeah. I'm looking yep. around like that's an actual term. Who told this little, yeah, who told this little guy he was a demon? You hear me? Like, why would you that's think crazy. this? And so what man, you 14, 15 years old talking about you on demon time, and I'm trying to figure out, like, yo, who told you you was a demon, bro? You feel me? And you right. acting it out. Like you yeah. causing mayhem, like you you own that. And so right. I felt like I had to try to do something. Like I knew I couldn't do much. So I started a nonprofit. I started mentoring kids, bro. And I started going to the schools. Um, good looking to DJ Hilson, man. Nate, they put me in position when nobody else was opening up their school doors to me independently. Like I was, I was calling, bro. I was going up there filling out paperwork to try to get them to like the Muskegon Heights High School, you know, and they wouldn't let me in to to deal with these kids. And, you know, DJ stepped in and Nate stepped in, and all of a sudden we doing. 20, 30 schools around Muskegon County. Wow. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have an impact on the kids, bro, because I felt like they've been misguided. And you have, you've had people that come home from prison with ulterior motives that's using these kids, bro, for their own selfish, for their own selfish desires and greed. And so I just kind of wanted to correct the narrative. Like everybody that come out of prison, I want to take advantage of these kids. Everybody that come out of prison, don't want to just ignore, neglect, or you know, misuse these kids. Let me figure out a way to where mm -hmm. I could take my experiences and hopefully let it serve as a blessing and a benefit to them. Maybe they can learn from something that I say 
to prevent them from doing something stupid, right? right. And so I just kind of um started really reaching out to them, bro, trying to be a good mentor to them, trying to be a good positive light to them and let them understand, like, once they once the system gets you, bro, they got you. You know what I mean? For real. Like, don't nobody want to be in prison that's in there. Like, it's people that's in there <laughs> doing real. time right now. That, that I've never heard it. nobody yeah, really say, bro, this is my there. home. You hear me? But it seemed like they out here running to it. Yeah. You feel me? So I was like, yeah. why are you so interested in going to prison or dying, bro? So yeah, I just kind of wanted to try to create a different mental shift and whoever I could. Um, and so that's what I got on, bro. That's what really kind of, you know, propelled me into different rooms and spaces and places is because... Right. Of of my you know my aggressive tactics in terms of mentorship, bro. You you touched a lot of big points, so I'm a I'm a backtrack a little bit. So you said that you have a nonprofit organization. What what is your nonprofit? The Redemption Coalition. Mm, and what is that? What is the foundation of 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 this structure? We got three we got three factors three points to it. The first primary point is youth outreach within the category of youth outreach we do gang prevention um mm -hmm. mentorship um and we try to instill a different mindset um a mental shift in the kids so our primary focus is the kids uh but there are other aspects to it okay. but that's been our primary our primary push for the last couple of years is mm. reaching out to these kids more so showing people how to engage them right you can't you know, and the pastors get mad when I said, but you can't approach these kids with your suit on, thumping a Bible, reading scripture. That's Didn't true. I just tell you they was on demon time, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I just tell you that. You feel me? Bro, I you just been... here and told you they on demon time, and you go try to exercise yeah. them with the biblical scripture. They don't want to hear it. And so if the goal is to reach them, you have to sometimes reach them where they're at. So, That's true. You know, you gotta you you gotta come out of that suit, bro. You gotta you gotta come from behind that pool pit, you know, because we're talking about their life is at stake at this point. So you have to you have to kind of put away some of your traditional tools and some of your traditional ways of thinking in order to um be successful in your objective. Right? You make you made a good point, but you know, I, the the problem that I see with a lot of us leaders, you know, and 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 I'm not trying to bash nobody. If you're trying to do good, yeah. but in order to lead, you must first follow. Facts. So if you're unable to actually step out of the suit, put down the Bible, get off your high horse, drop the ego, yeah. Yeah. which is hard as hell for 90% of the world. And to sit, to sit back and 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 hear you speak or hear the children speak and tell yeah. tell them what is wrong. Tell tell us. Let us hear what is wrong. You're yeah. not. It's going to always going to be this. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's so, that's 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 the mentality that they come with. Is that you know I'm 40, 60, 70 years old. I know more than you. I'm a preacher. Or I'm in my church, and I'm, you know, I'm successful in my career. I know more than you, and so just because of that mindset that they have, their approach with these kids is coming right. off condescending. You're not coming in as yeah. a listener. You're not <laughs> coming in as a support system, yeah. right? You coming in like you wrong. This why you wrong, and you need to do better. I'm gonna pray for you. That that's nothing for a demon. And I'm only <laughs> saying that they do because that's what they keep telling me. I'm on demon time, kids. <laughs> It blows my mind. Man. You see what I'm saying? It's right. like you, you, you approaching guys, you know, and girls, they, they got this oh, mentality yeah. um, that they're on demon time. And so you want to come at them yeah. in a way that they're not going to receive. And so because of that, you've not been successful, right? You've not been able to to meet them where they are. Um, and I don't have, a, I don't bash pastors. You know, and I've been getting a lot of like, why do you keep going at the preachers? Why do you keep going at the <laughs> Hey, I was about to bring that up. Like, hey, what? <laughs> yeah, I don't bash them. I love them. You feel me? I love them. And, 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 but I love them enough to tell them the truth. And the reason that I point them out is because in like our that. community, and in our culture, our ministers have always been the pillar of strength. The church has always been a distribution center of faith, hope, and love. You see what I'm saying? And so because you've you've accepted the mantle of leadership, 
You've accepted the responsibility of leadership. You've opened yourself up to critique and criticism because you accepted that. That's the life you chose. You see what I'm saying? So mm. you got people around here that I may never say nothing against because they haven't accepted leadership roles. But the moment that you accept right. the leadership role, you're held to a different standard and responsibility. And so when I call out the leaders, it's not to bash them. It's to say, bro, you accepted a responsibility. Why well, don't see you being responsible? And, and that's why I brought up the fact that one of the worst neighborhoods in Muskegon Heights, they claim is East Park Manor. They claim it's the projects. But within a three block radius of the projects, there's 12 churches. How is the worst? That's how is the worst? How is the worst neighborhood in Muskegon Heights surrounded by 12 churches? <laughs> that's that hey, it, point. That's 12 point. different leaders, 12 different congregations, 12 different opportunities to be responsible for the very community that your church is situated in. So it's not me bashing you, it's me asking you. Like, listen, bro, why are you only seen in this neighborhood for Sunday service? Mm. Your church exists in this neighborhood. These kids out here on demon time, right? These families are deteriorating. The neighborhood is declining in every social and economical aspect imaginable. Why aren't our community leaders, right. i.e. pastors, ministers, shepherding the flock? What happened here? Because there was a time where it was the ministers who led the way. And so my only thing is, in knowing the culture and knowing our history and knowing our community, why aren't you leading the way? Mm. That's the only thing I'm saying. I'm not bashing them, bro. I'm not I'm not coming at them personally, you know, because I'm related to them. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and a lot of people in the community, they support me. And so they like, why are you turning the community against us? Turning the community against you? Your lack of effort and your lack of concern for this community is what turned the community against you. The only thing I did was speak on it. That's it. See, and that is the. I'm sorry to cut you off, man, but, but bro, that is a hot topic that yeah. we I feel like needs to be changed in every community, not just the black community, in every community that. Yeah. If something goes on within our circle that we know, we know is hard, that hard. needs to be addressed. Gotcha. You, you, you gotta, you gotta address it. You, somebody has to say, bro, enough is enough. This is disgusting, bro. Yeah. Like, so you, you're raping, you know, underage kids. You're, 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 you're sleeping with the uh, uh, husbands and wives of married people. You're coming off. You, you know, yeah. talking about. You shouldn't smoke and yep. you shouldn't drink, but I see you in the club Come on. <laughs> you feel behind me like, the DJ booth. Come that's on, the bro. VIP that's area. The thing, like, like, you got to think, <laughs> I, you know, I got ties to this community and I got love for my people in this community and they got love for me. And so I'm, I've seen it, I've heard it, and I could, I could say all type of vile, profane things against people right. because I know, I know, I know what you're doing. You feel me? <laughs> I'm not right. here for it. I'm just saying, bro, can you can you step up a little bit? Can you that's it? Can you help in this fight a little you bit? can still live your life. Your it's life, bro. When it's time for you to put on that suit, on, put on that suit. That's it. And you know, I'm gonna say this, bro. When I went through my case, I'll never forget this. When I was going through my case, Bishop Wells from Holy Trinity, rest in peace. Bishop Wells came and begged that judge not to send me to prison, right? He told the judge, give them to me. I'll take them. This one of the biggest leading, you know, ministers um, in Michigan, on this side of the state, on West Michigan. You know, he was the bishop and, you know, one of the people that were governing the whole Kojic system in West Michigan. And so, you know, I'll never forget that, man. That did something for me. I appreciated that. I appreciated Reverend Hunter from Beulah stepping up and coming to my court date, seeing about me, you know, mm. checking in on me, just showing his support, right? right? I remember pastors while I was in prison, like Jerry Riley from Upper Room, sending me newsletters, you know what I'm saying? I'm getting, I don't have nothing else to look forward to. All of a sudden, I get a newsletter under my door from their, from their ministry, and I'm being able to do something constructive with my time. Like, I'm remember, I, I 
I've experienced these things. And that's why I say I love pastors. I love ministers, right? I went into the juvenile detention center this summer, over the summer, to mentor the uh, young men and young ladies. And I didn't put it on Facebook. A lot of the stuff that I do, I don't put on Facebook. But I, got, I was able to get into the JDC by miracle due to my past. And I was able to go in there and mentor and teach chess, right? Why isn't the pastors and the ministers getting in there talking to them kids? Because they right at that, they right there at that edge, they either gonna jump or you're gonna pull them away from the club.